Hi, I'm Ben Hunt of Epsilon Theory. And I'm panicked about the coordinated attack in narrative world on the United States. Jensen. Lindzen. Burke. I'm here. <laughs> he won't conform. Have you met the new chief of staff? He named himself that last week. I know. Yeah. I don't know. What does that make you? I don't know. Next thing you know, he's gonna, he moved into Tom's office. <laughs> <laughs> Tom's well, got a cubby. That won't Hopefully last Tom long. doesn't I told to him this. to do that. That'll, that'll teach him. Tom, Tom will uh, fix him. <laughs> I said, why don't you move into Tom's office? He may not be coming back. He's all moved in there. Tom's in this little cubby. A little... But uh, anyways, that should work well. Front desk. So, we still got all the Norwegians in town. We do, for a short time. I, I never listened to podcasts of mine, but the Frederick one was great. It was good, huh? Yeah. I enjoyed it. Well, I'm glad. I don't think people had context. Hans is in town, one of my best friends, one of your best friends. I know, it's really awesome. But you Is know, he your don't... best friend? Uh, he's one of my very, very best friends. And, and no when I'm about. hanging with him, are you jealous? No. No. Uh. Yeah. All right. well, I, I just wish I played golf, I only too. hang with him to make you jealous, and knowing that, I can now avoid hanging with him. <laughs> well, he's, he's leaving Tuesday next week, so we got to figure something Back else. Back to Thailand? Back to Thailand, Bangkok. So, people, listener, Ethan's parents, um, <laughs> new listeners, are they listening? Uh, my grandpa might be. Grandpa? And grandpa's a traitor. My grandpa is a traitor. So, Gramps, what's Gramps' name? Bruce. Shout out to Bruce Burke. That's a strong name. Wow. They lightened up with Ethan Burke. Yeah. Much lighter. And Bobby Burke would be a great name. No, I'm changing you. You're BB. You're Bobby Burke. BB. Double Bobby B. Burke. Anyway, so uh, shout out to uh, Bruce Burke. But, you know, Hans is in town. He is still. He went to, he's very, uh, we were playing, we mentioned, and uh, a good golfer. You don't play anymore. He's a great golfer. You don't play anymore. I No, only for social reasons. And Morton's in town. So the four of us used to play golf a lot, would you say? I would say so, we, yes. We got an MBA. We did. Uh, well, that was our minor. The major was golf. <laughs> At uh, ASU, they built a course for us like a week before we did our MBA. What a joy that was. Yeah, we did the marketing campaign for I that. What, we that? have lived, haven't we? With Chris Ewan. I know we have lived. Yeah, remember we let Chris on fire? Wasn't that oh. fun? That we is a one great, of our great fire. story. But you it, know was a, it was a business project. Yeah. We were trying out an asbestos uh, flame retardant. Uh, it worked. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he got a free meal out of it. Chris he did. Ewan. Have we talked to Chris Ewan? No, is we have not. Is he still mad? No. I okay. think, uh, but the you funny... Think, the fun, you think a guy wouldn't get mad when you light him on fire at uh, All You Can Eat uh, Benny Hanna thing? Dude, I felt so bad because I'm the one who actually poured, you know, the whatever, the sake or whatever. But not on purpose. No, no, no. Drunk. No, but I'm... <laughs> so yeah, this was right around uh, the end of the fall semester. Uh, he, he showed up the first day of the spring semester. Did his mid- shirt catch on fire with with, a, with, the with his hand wrapped in a, in yeah, a bandage? Yeah, he played that. He out. fucked with us. He played that. I know. Anyways, and now there's a building named after him at ASU with uh, a sushi place in it. Is that a true story? <laughs> no, not no, making that. I don't up. think so. So, anyways, uh, Hans in town, Morton's in town. Uh, we haven't the four of us gotten together, just the three of us. So we'll have to quickly try and do that this weekend. Yeah, we'll see if we can make that work. All right. Well, today, I want to jump right into our guest. He is a record-breaking guest on this show. Um, I feel bad for him, really. (laughs) This says nothing other than I feel bad for guests that come on frequently. He's very nice. He still says yes. He was maybe the smartest guy I know, and I don't like saying that out loud, so what? We'll just make sure he doesn't hear that part until until we go live. Later. But when I mean smartest is he's just explainer he explains things very easily and i like complex things explained easily he's been around the block he's a doctor he's, a, he's doctor professor ben hunt beekeeper uh farm owner market lover and standing up to everybody on the internet he he, he, he uh he's no flip-flopper he just has um he really believes strongly in what he believes in and you can't bullshit him and a uh, doctor Ben Hunt is, uh, I don't know how to describe it. Epsilon Theories just write these great essays about uh, narratives in the market. 
and he's built a lot of data around it. So we'll catch up with him. The big thing right now is there's just, I call it Jim Cramer 2.0. I don't think Ben reads my blog, but I call it Jim Cramer 2.0. And when we live in this, you know, part of my themes going you know, for the next 10 years are this, America has become this rich, angry, degenerate economy. I call it the rich man, angry man, degenerate economy. And as an investor, long term, I, I think along those lines. Ben thinks along lines of narrative, and it's very. Him and I are very. Pro, I came from Canada, so I'm very pro U.S. You know, we've got our our flaws, but I've been around the world. You too. Yeah. This is the place, yep. and it just seems like everybody's ganging up. Everybody's getting louder and angrier. So I hated TV, which is why I started Wall Street, which is why I love podcasting. But we've created what seems to be a worse dynamic, which is uh, the people that we thought had too much power on TV have quadrupled the power on podcast and the internet. And so the, the, the power shift is super interesting and in what we hope for, but it's also creating its own problems. And around the economy in the U.S., and around the U.S. dollar, it's uh, peaking. And who do you believe? Who? What is real news? What is really going on? Who is... What is behind all these crazy moves, China, Russia, U.S., uh, venture capitalists, uh, banks? There's been a lot of black swans. So to talk about narratives, uh, I thought I'd bring on Ben because he's been so right about many of these narratives. One of the biggest ones he was right about is that inflation, um, unfortunately, is right, is the inflation shock and awe that we've had over the last year and a half and how the narrative uh, changed there. And then we'll go into the narrative around the dollar in U.S. economy. So let's let's dial them up. Ben, Howard, sixth time. That's a record, right? Yeah, it's a record. Jim O'Shaughnessy maybe behind you. I think he's uh, he's four, maybe five. Yeah, Jeff Richards coming right back, up, right around the same. Oh man, scenario. that's great! I've lapped the field. Yeah, yeah you have. have lapped the field. Also, it's common sense. I feel like I need to talk to you because you are, like me, consistent in battling away. It seems to be in the in 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 the dark, like uh, Luke Skywalker with the saber, uh, lunatics, funny people, uh, just trolls, but lunatics, lunatics. But we know what we're getting into. Sometimes I yeah. I wade into your comments and I go, well, why is even Ben engaging with these knuckleheads? <laughs> and he's a doctor. He's thing. a professor. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Former, I've been defrocked. You've been defrocked, which is good. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I mean, back when I was a professor, you know, I had time to go play golf and stuff, and I haven't played in twenty years. Those were the days. Yeah, you're not missing anything. Golf has been taken over by basically human machines that have figured out how to create maximum swing speed, uh, <laughs> only to be outdone by uh, horticulturalists and technology ball makers and uh, the ability to just make courses longer. So the game. Just like the market, golf has become a game which uh, the people, the builders of the course, they're all just battling against each other, right? The golfers get stronger yeah. and faster, and the courses get longer and harder. And the regular man, like us, left behind, left fucking behind, going, "How do that they is do like that?" The markets, my God, that, that's yeah, a great it's market very analogy. Much. Golf is so How are you much. You got to write on that. That's a good one. Uh, but yeah, this is how I've been thinking about things. Golf is one of those sports, much like the U.S. economy, which is very interesting to me because luckily I, I know and I got to play it a lot as a young person. Very privileged game. Yep. Kind of like the U.S. not growing, but there's so much creation around the game. And, you know, the golf gods want it to be more open. You know, you had the Tiger Woods and you got the Masters, which is kind of like Kentucky. All of Kentucky, I guess, or Alabama, or Louisiana, or Georgia, I guess, where it is. Uh, so you have all these battles going on, but the big battle is the elitists, which are these golfers that figured out mechanically how to be superheroes, um, pre-puberty, actually, and mechanics. Yeah. And if you don't get into the game when you're eight, you're, you can't be in the game. You just won't have the swing speed. Like, that's where it's gotten to. And so it's become like exclusive in a new way. But anyways, in the U.S. economy, it's kind of the same thing, right? Like the last 12 years, Ben, we've had like a misdirection, like the way I see it. Like all these kids, you know, when GFC happened, and I'll, I'll let you comment on this. When GFC happened, like I didn't realize how bad it was, but I'm talking to a lot uh -huh. of kids that went to went into the workforce then. And they were like Yale kids, uh, really smart, 
you know, education, and they were cleaning cars at Hertz. This right. time, these elite kids from Stanford and Harvard were making four hundred grand moving pixels, getting fed, you know, with RSUs too. They haven't even seen like we're so far away from GFC and like and yet everybody's screaming bloody murder. Like what what happened here? Right. Yeah. You know, when I write about it, Howard, I call it fiat world. Right? So it's it's you know, we know what fiat currency is, right? I mean, mm-hmm. well when we talk about that all the time, it's currency that resides on the full faith and credit of the United States, right? And that's it. There's nothing else behind it. It's 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 words. We live in a fiat world today where everything is declared, right? And so we certainly have fiat news. That's when I really first started thinking about this stuff, which is that it's not fake news, but 99% of the stuff you see on CNBC or Bloomberg or CNN or Fox or, or the like, it's not actually information. It's not news. It's opinion presented as news. Correct. So it's it is exactly like fiat money. It's you know <laughs> a piece of paper presented to you as money. And when I started thinking about this way, first of all, you think about all the old ideas about money, right? That you know uh, bad money drives out of circulation the good money. Well, that's exactly the same way it is with news, right? Bad or Opinion-led news drives out information-led news. I mean, to the point where there is no news. That's the point, exactly. It's really really horrible. Exactly, right? And it's, it's, you know, I I was looking at the the, the White House press release on inflation, or whatever the last, you know, inflation number came out, and and the the press release said, inflation is down 30% since... You know, a couple of months ago, oh, yeah. and it's like, well, what? What? You just, I guess that statement is somehow true, but it's it's just like ridiculous. Or I, I look, I, I know you've been taking on Shamath and his last quarterly letter or his last annual letter. I did some stuff on. I think it was the annual letter before this one, where he was talking about, oh, in my portfolio, I outperformed the S and P five hundred by forty percent. And what he meant was, I was up 1.4%, and the S&P 500 was up 1%, right? You know, it's just, so you're just kind of declaring this stuff. Oh, I've outperformed by this enormous amount, or oh, I'm declaring that inflation has been vanquished, when there, there's no there there. It's there's just no- it's just a fiat world, and and that's exactly what Wall Street is like today. That's exactly what so many of these jobs as you're describing i mean they, it's you know symbolic manipulation in a fiat world yeah in in chamas defense my testosterone score is so far above average that i've <laughs> i'm wearing it around my neck on a gold chain so i am 70 percent higher than the average 20 year old so in yeah, his defense uh-huh, uh-huh. i now have decided to take those type of headline numbers and apply them to my life where it applies. But yeah, we'll get to Tremoth in a little bit and all these, the Jim Cramer 2.0. But I, getting right to the meat of it, you and I do yeah. think like, like this rational optimism. When I think about myself, when I start stock tips, I would say, you know, why do we have to say beginner, intermediate, expert? There is no such thing in investing. Same with uh-uh. skiing, right? It's, it's about your mood and your style. It's like there's the pessimist, there's the external yep. optimist, there's the negative ninny. There's the value person. There's the person who you, who yep. who will never who is stiff and you can't move. Like you can't put people in a bucket. You can only just give them titles that maybe they would, you know, let people choose. Give them more than three choices. So this whole idea of I'm an optimist, but when I saw this piece about rational optimism, and that goes to what you're saying about uh, news and opinion, I <laughs> loved it. And this. You, I play what you would call a metagame in rational optimism. I live mm-hmm. a life as a venture capitalist. I know sometimes that I'm just going to be wrong, but I have to make a bet sometimes, and I size it properly. And I know sometimes I'm, I'm going to be I have better odds of being right, and I can't wait to put more money into it. I Meaning, I'm not betting against anything. I, I'm trying not to time things, but I am. I've positioned myself as a rational optimist. How do you see that 
And why is that become, why are we in the minority when that's how the country was built? It's weird, Howard, because I, I, in my investing life, because I wasn't in ever on the private side with venture or or where I think you have to have, to be successful, you've got to have that, uh, as you described, that rational optimism. So I was I started in investing in public markets, and I developed a real short seller's mentality when I first came into the markets. Right. So I, I my favorite superhero. I, there's a connection here. I promise you. So my, my favorite superhero, he's one of the Inhumans, and his name is Karnak. So the you know the deal with this these mutants, the Inhumans, is that they've all got one gift. Right. They've all got one special gift. Superpower. Yeah. And uh, Karnak's gift is that he can see the flaw in all things. <laughs> right. And it turns out that's like an S tier superpower to see the flaw in all things. Uh, and I feel like when I was getting my start in, in investing in public markets and the hedge fund, I really naturally gravitated to the short side of the long short book. And this was, you know, I was starting in 05, 06, and 07, and I had the right mindset to understand how the world was going to come unglued in 2008. And we were able to act on that, right? And it, you know, made our fund. It made, I think, my career in a lot of respects. So I, I really kind of came into this investing world really from that, that short perspective. I will tell you, though, Howard, over time, you know, what is it, what is it Hobbes, you know, said about, you know, life in the state of nature is nasty, brutish, and short? Well, that's kind of the life of a short seller because you are, you're constantly contrarian. You're constantly going against the flow of information from Wall Street, which is always buy, buy, buy. Mm -hmm. And it, it wears you down. And it wears you down in a way that can make you a very bitter, curmudgeonly, shake your fist at clouds kind of person. And I just, I don't want to. I don't want to be that that person. No I don't want to be that person. So I'm, yeah. I, I got it. You know, I'm still wired for seeing the flaw in things, but in my actual life, you know, my my non-investing life, I really do believe in that up into the right arrow for history and human ingenuity, and I'm a patriotic guy. Right. right. I love this country. And so I tried to reserve my finding the flaw in all things for the political entrepreneurs on both sides of the political spectrum, for the, I like to call it the, the Peter Thiel industrial complex of, I like that. you know, Thiel adjacent billionaires who, accelerationists, I guess they call themselves these days, who are absolutely trying to tear things down. And, um, you know, I'm really trying to reserve my anger for the people tearing it down. I still get angry about things. I, you know, I still like to say burn it the fuck down when it comes to pedophiles and outright thieves and raccoons and the like. But I really am trying to be more constructive. That, that as you say, rational optimism. It's, I think, both a challenge and an opportunity thinking about these large language models, GPT-4, which, frankly, we've started implementing in our own firm. And i, I got to tell you, we're seeing 100x improvements in some of our workflows from this stuff. That's cool. So I am getting optimistic, Howard, at the same time yeah, where I'm, you, I'm down you about playing. the, you know, like, say, the Peel adjacent bros and China and Russia and all that I call stuff. them Zerpy the Clowns. Yeah, I love that. So there's the Teal adjacent Zerpy the Clowns, which, you know, people, I, I love the way they, Peter Teal blew the fuck up his hedge fund, yes. I don't know, from $8 billion to zero, um, yes. which people yeah. just conveniently never bring conveniently up. Conveniently forget, yeah. Conveniently forget. And we're seeing it happen with the Zerpy the Clown crew. We don't know the end results. I'm, I'm part of the Zerpy the Clown era myself. I just mm -hmm. happen to be old enough to have been pre-Zerpy the Clown too, GFC. Uh, bucket holder, 
I've been a GFC bucket holder and Zerpy the Clown in, in, in my <laughs> formative investing years. The, uh, so I love that because when I listen, and again, I don't listen to the all in. My problem with the destructionist is that I'm drawn into the conversation because my yep. LPs and friends listen. And yep. so whenever I talk to, uh, not my real friends like Canute, but my friends from business who are great people, they they bring this up, yeah. And I say, why are you listening to this? Uh, aren't they Kramer 2.0? Aren't they the same people that we tried to disrupt with the internet? And you know, so we have the same problem: information overloads accelerating, and filter failure is unfortunately not being practiced. So I'm filtering, which is how I come to you, and mm -hmm. everybody else is filter failing and listening to crap. So I'm so happy that you've come over. Listen, I obviously we've been friends because I knew you were a rational optimist, even though you were uh, <laughs> uh, Professor Grumpy Pants. Yeah. For the last 10 years, because you kind of have been right, right? Like the narrative has been wrong. They've been throwing shit down our throats, whether it's food, with sugar, uh, the drug companies. But in the end, up until the right still works. The drug companies aren't as bad as you would say, it's not good, but it yeah. ain't bad. I'm on many drugs, and I feel I live a pretty good life. You know, I'm not going to complain every day about the drug companies ripping me up, but I'm, again, I, I see why people are mad. So, so I tell you, yeah, yeah, let me, I, there's there's something on this. So, you know, I, I was a discretionary hedge fund portfolio manager for, I don't know, a lot of years. And I'm kind of back in the game now, but not with a discretionary fund as a systematic fund. And, the difference is just so important for me being able to not age in dog years and for me to not become that grumpy guy, you know, grandpa shaking his fist at clouds because I was a good discretionary portfolio manager. I was not a great discretionary portfolio manager. You know why? Because I cared about being right. Yeah, not <laughs> and, a good and thing. That's, and you can't do that, right? When you're responsible for other people's money, your responsibility is make money, <laughs> you yep. know, not be right. And the way to be right is not the way always often the way to make money. The way to make money, I'm convinced now, is you identify these narratives and you go with it. You don't fight it, even though it's fiat, it's made up, it's 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 opinion presented as fact. <laughs> you know. Fighting it for what is truth with a capital T for being right, I mean, it's... No, uh, hallelujah yeah. for you. That's where I came up with rich man, angry man, degenerate yeah. man. I don't, I'm not bullish on degenerates. It just is. And it degenerates aren't all bad. Degenerates, they, it's not my son's fault or Ethan's fault or anybody's fault that does parlays uh, that DraftKings, FanDuel, MGM, Bet Caesars <laughs> can advertise endlessly to them. It's not their fault. It's like their tobacco. It's like their Elvis. It's like whatever we were arguing about before. It's just how they are integrated into the world. I, I think about this all the time, Howard. Can you imagine how different your life would have turned out? I'm not saying it would have been worse. I'm just saying it would have been really different if online 24-7 gambling had been available to you when you were in college. Dude, I <laughs> got kidding? home from school, walked home from school, and my mom said, see you at dusk. <laughs> no, it was a safe neighborhood, and I would just go make up games with my neighbors. Yeah. And I would come home hungry. There was no time. And then Mattel and television was the first thing. And I remember it was so stupid, yet so um, uh, addictive, even in that time, or, yes. or Pong. So, yeah, these poor kids had no shot. No shot. And again, maybe it's a great thing, but they had no shot to be right. It's not a different thing. It's a different thing. I, but but I, my life would have been so different because hmm. I, I know myself. I I mean, I would have, or if crypto had been around, or mm -hmm. you know, drug, you know, online gaming and poker, if that had been around when I was in college, my life would have gone down a totally different path. <laughs> Yeah, we had to throw notes at people during class. <laughs> like, now, right. like, 
if you threw a no to class, you know, they would, well, first of all, that would be fun. Like, I still think that's a way to communicate. We do that here in the studio. I just threw Canute a question on a piece of paper. Um, but think about that. So it's like the rich man, angry man, degenerate man. And I think yeah. I love, I'm going to add in the rational optimist to my new narrative. So how is that play out to you? Like when everybody's trying to bring it like house down and you are, you have this thing, burn it all down. How do we, how do we position ourselves to be rational optimists? Uh, do we just tune out? Do we just niche up in our communities like people do with me or people do with you and just tune it all out? Or is there a way to get involved? How do we get involved and like change this? It is both of the things you described, right? So the first is I'm going to describe it as, you know, whatever people say, you know, go out and touch grass. All right, that's that's very true. I think that's limited because we have to live in this world, right? Even if we're not of this world, we have to live in it. And so we can't just go off the grid and air gap ourselves. And like you say, you hang out with anybody in finance and they're going to want to talk about all in or, you know, what's happening with Elon or all that, right? Mm -hmm. And you, you can't you can't escape it so long as we're going to be in this world. Mm -hmm. So it's that second part that you described. I like to call it, you know, finding your pack. Right? You have to find the people who will not treat you as a means to an end, but treat you as an autonomous human being of free will and require that you do the same. And and that's for a lot of people, you know, if you're lucky enough, that's your family as a start. Uh, maybe it's a, a larger group. I tell you, it's not, though. It's not a corporation. You know, you are a means to an end. It's not your political party. You're a means to an end. And <laughs> we have to recognize that that's how we are being treated. We're being treated as a cog. The problem is that, as you were saying earlier, now that we've moved to this immersive world of social media, where I carry around my, I call it my dopamine machine, my little smartphone here, and I voluntarily let it dominate my life. I mean, I don't know if we talked about this last time. It's the saddest thing in the world. I, I mean, the last thing I look at when I go to bed at night, when I go to sleep at night, and the last thing, I, and the first thing I look at when I wake up in the morning, it's not my wife. It's my smartphone. I mean, how pathetic is that? Yeah. So we've, we've done this to ourselves, we've let it in, and we have to wean ourselves out as best we can, but the only thing we can do other than that is to find other people who will treat us as actual human beings, and not as, like I say, a, a, a cog in whatever their, their machine is, because it's a powerful machine. Powerful. And so when it comes to the future, where are we in this? So inflation, the narrative was completely wrong. Now there's this narrative of Russia, China, U.S., dollar, banks. Like, where are we with that? And how are you feeling about that? Well, it's just not true. I, I mean, it's, it's look, I, I get it. So, so the U.S. decided to use the dollar as a strategic weapon against Russia after the Ukraine invasion. Like, and we're pretty sure of that? Well, yeah. I mean, I mean that when the when the U.S. says, "Okay, we're taking the you know Russian banks off of SWIFT," right? Good point. I, I mean, you're using you're using the dollar as a weapon. And Got it. I, like I say, I'm a patriotic guy. I think, heck yeah, that's what you do when you you've got that asymmetric power in that field. So I get it that that Russia and China and Iran, they're going to fight back, right? And so that you fight back by trying to do non-dollar denominated deals, you fight back by trying to encourage people to think of the dollar system as failing. Huh. It, but, it, but it's a strategic effort by our strategic adversaries, speaking as an American. It's also a strategic effort by, I say, the, the teal industrial complex uh, to, I, I really believe, you know, intentionally accelerate the decline or, or, or collapse of our system so they can be, you know, the rulers of some neo-feudal little crew they've got going on there. And it is just, 
maddening to me because it's such a concerted effort is what political consultants for political campaigns used to call astroturfing. It's fake grassroots. That's what an astroturf campaign is, fake mm. grassroots. And this is what you see all over in social media today. It, it, it's very hard to stop. The reason I think it's so important to stop is for something I write a lot about, and that's called common knowledge. So common knowledge is not what we may think you know, exists in the world. It's not what we know. It's what we know that everyone else knows. And the danger with all of these, call them Renfields, you know, the, the servants of the vampires, all these media Renfields, whether it's on the left, like Fareed Zakaria on CNN. I mean, I went to grad school with Fareed. I know Fareed. Dude, that guy's lost the script. Oh, my God, right? And, you know, for I don't Fareed, even know why I'm seeing him right now. I have to block well, you're, his name. You're, I didn't even I, know who I, he I was I know why you're it. seeing him, because he did his segment on, oh, the de-dollarization of America. Oh. Just like you saw, you know, you're going to see a lot more of Tucker, who came out yesterday with, oh, my God, the de-dollarization of America. And Wait a minute, they're, they're together on this, the two idiots? Absolutely. Ooh, so that's the, dangerous. Well, it's the, this is what I'm saying. It's the, the political entrepreneurs, the poles of both sides of our political spectrum, they want chaos. Our strategic uh, adversaries, oh, they, they want out chaos. The, the touching point is chaos. Great. The touching point is chaos, and the means to do it is not in real world space because you're really limited the way to, the place to do it is a narrative world got it through so you're this, saying both sides yeah. are finally agreed the best clicks are if they agree and just have chaos yes that's right so so, so both side, that one. It, look, we see it all over the place. i mean i never the, saw this, that this I they were just the trump, opposite this indictment of trump right so yeah they kind of are together on it oh the white house loves this are you kidding yeah. Yeah. they want desperately for Trump to be the nominee, or if he can't be the nominee, they want him desperately to be in a powerful enough position that he can withhold his support from DeSantis, right? Because they can't beat DeSantis, but they are confident they can beat Trump. Metagame. Exactly. Exactly, Howard. It's a metagame of both ends of the spectrum playing against the middle. And here, here you and I are, rational optimists, we're stuck in the middle. My problem is I live in Howie Town, which is full of nerfs and balloons Howie and Town. lollipops. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, I'm in the opposite of, of what's going on. This is great. I didn't even, yeah, I just blocked the name the other day because I didn't like the look of this guy before. And then I heard him speak and I'm like, this fucking idiot, isn't he a doctor? Like, for, not nothing against doctors, you're one. But uh, and I'm, <laughs> no, a no, I'm not, I'm not a real doctor at this point. But yeah. oh my god, this guy's a fucking knucklehead. And proof is that Tucker Carlson, who's become an expert on everything, uh, I guess over the last four years, uh, has now become a dollar expert. It's just so maddening. It is pretty maddening. Which is but it's going to get worse, I man. Lo- it's it's going to get worse, Howard. It's absolutely yeah. going to get worse. Which is good for my traffic because I'm the only guy making fun of them all. But it's it's me farting in a windstorm is what you're saying. That's so, what it is. Farting yeah, I don't mind farting. Storm. I see you engaging in the farts, and I worry about you. Like I'm well, farting I, 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 and I, retreating. Know, last week, I just I just totally yeah. Your uh, stuff's too good. Back. You just you need to leave it out there and let the let the imbeciles do with I, I, it what they may. But 100%. I only read it and then go, oh, thank you, Ben, and I retreat to Howie Town, uh, where it's all bubbly. I'm, I'm, and, I'm doing the nice. same. I'm doing the same. I'm, I'm, I'm only going to engage where it gives me a chance to say, here's an article we wrote on this. You just, just do that and just say, hey, CC Howie Town, <laughs> lollipops and balloons over there. But uh, I do appreciate, you know, I miss Josh Brown because he was kind of like yep. you. Uh, he was level-headed. He could go both ways. But then in the end, he, you know, and there's Barry Ritholtz, who isn't as, as funny, but obviously he's, he's the meathead in the middle like me. Right. Um, but there's very few of us, right? Like Fred Wilson has, has stepped out of the arena. By the way, arena. Who the fucking Jamoth calling this thing the arena? The man in the arena. Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. What kind of arena is it? It's pink and with thin legs. Chicken legs. Right. The, the uh, arena thin leg, skips leg chicken days. leg arena. Yeah, skips leg days. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, here's a great story for you, Ben. Sure. Uh, uh, 
Steve Hilton, who built a $4 billion home builder, was survived the crash in 08. Uh, obviously, an $800 million loss in 08, he was telling our, our audience. Um, you know, after the amazing home builder run up, and everybody drinks their own Kool Aid. This time around, you know, he's here speaking to our entrepreneurs, you know, just chairman now and retired, but talking about his $1 billion war chest. And, and you know, going into this recession now, he's waiting that? for the thing to happen. It hasn't happened, but. He had done a reverse merger, I don't know, 25 years ago, uh-huh. when SPACs were SPACs, and uh, men were men. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, ZERP was, there was no ZERP. There was no the, ZERP. Uh, and I go, I, I thought I was being funny. I go, oh, like Chamath. And he goes, who's Chamath? And I was just like, <laughs> there's people out there that just don't know. And that's why they're rich, and that's why they're powerful. That's why and those they're are the rich. people, and he's not fucking running into climate like I saw the other idiotic thing in Chamas thing where, you know, he now is going into climate. And I'm like, you know, yeah. the good people went into climate like eight years ago. So basically he's saying there's growth opportunities because of the hard work that people pre narrative climate were getting into. He's just a momentum guy, which is great. Just call yourself a momentum investor. So Steve Hilton just was just hilarious because he was like literally not deadpan. He goes, who's Chamath? Like he, he didn't, he wanted to get back to the real discussion. So there are people out there that aren't engaging in this. And then, you know, Steve, there's people really worried about what's happening and they're not even online to see what's going on. Right. right. They see it in the streets. Right. They don't, they don't know why it's there, but we're seeing it in Israel. Right. With yep. Netanyahu. Yep. He's become sure. like fucking crazy. And now making political mistakes in front of everybody, right? Like he's lost his game at some level, like like Trump 2.0. Uh-huh. And I mean, Trump copied him, and now he's copying Trump, and that playbook's over, right? There's riots in Israel. Like, who loves that? You're right. Like the Arabs like that. Exactly. So, well, you know what I realized, Howard, was you know because I was you know like like you just said, I was engaging with. You know the Balajis of the world. Oh my you know, God! You, you know, and 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 I just it struck me so hard. This is last Friday that there is literally, I'm using the word correctly here, there is literally an infinite supply of Balajis, and you can engage with them, and you you think you're done, but you're never done. There is literally an infinite supply. That's a great line, and they are and they are literally promoted to you, right? So it they they it is this demon algo, right? That drives these I like to call them rage engagements. It's very intentional. There's an infinite supply. It's not there's not in, I guess there's an infinite supply of advertisers, but nobody you know nobody's going to advertise on Twitter. Or there's places like that, but there's an infinite supply of rage engagement and and I realized I was the product I was the product and I'm just at one I'm point set. Balaji was the product then he flipped and yeah. became the distributor became the distributor yes and yes. that's why he's only been on the podcast once not six times <laughs> is because I like to have the products on <laughs> I keep coming back to the Generative AI and the LLMs and the like, and I'm Good so. Point. Let's bring it back to reality. Let's here. bring it back to that because that is reality. It is and, reality, and I think a lot of people will use these tools for a two x improvement in their operational efficiency or their company or the like. But there are opportunities for one hundred x, yeah, deltas here, and 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 that doesn't come around more than once a generation, if that. So I, 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 I just interrupt quickly. Uh, yeah. I keep going. The, my buddy, Kerry Cooper, who's like, I don't know, 67, he used ChatGPT on his phone. He said he was giving a toast to his French friend, and he said, give me a filthy French joke into ChatGPT, and he said he slayed it, right? Like, that's yeah. fucking 100x. That's 1,000x. It's... um. You know what it is? So it's the not, phone it's that you just, said is like the destructor just fucking lit up a person's life. Right. You know what I mean? And just the superpower, that was like a, a that was a hundred X superpower of what uh, Chap GPT just did to a, a speech. A speech. We've got too much riding in the real world right now 
for me or for you or for anyone to get dragged down into the rage engagements with the, you know, the Balajis and the AstroTurf crew on Twitter and the like. So I'm, I, it's because the, 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 the struggle, the real world struggle is going to be intense. And the, what I mean by struggle is these tools are going to be used against us because they can also make a 100x difference in the ability of governments and corporations to nudge us, to create these astroturf campaigns to destabilize us. And so what we've got to do is not, as you say, fart into the, the hurricane, but actually build our own shields and tools and art and amazing new businesses and business models and just cool shit that we can build now. Yeah. That's what we got to do. Yep. And and that's the only hope of a rational optimist, like you're saying. Yeah, rational optimism somehow produced AI. Sam Altman seems like an okay guy for the moment. And what's great about the Sam Altman story is Musk fucked it up. He walked away, if I'm to believe it. So it's like, there's all these four. It's kind of like Marvel or Marvel, whatever you call it. Like the world is fucking. It's just up and to the right. Uh, but there is always that asymmetric. There is no halfway down. It's fucking mess if we lose this part of the world to yeah. the KO, the chaos. Now the chaos are blaming. Obviously, they're blaming the last group, which they call what is it, Soros and Gates. Yeah, sure. Is there anything truth to that? Like, is that is that just a good argument to create chaos? Do they really Absolutely. believe it? Absolutely. It's just, it's, it, and it's a good argument because it's very truthy. Ooh, truthy. Right? So that, that's where, you know, these LLMs and these, these transformers really excelled. It's not at providing the truth with the capital T, but the way they're designed and built is to provide the answer that sounds truthy. Mm-hmm. And that's why they're such powerful tools to rewrite history to create compelling stories that are about de-dollarization or the American banking system is about to collapse. And Probably it's, never been stronger. I, I believe that, right? They did the right thing. Like, they wiped out 100%. the equity. That's a hundred times. That's a, hun- that's a chat GPT answer to 2008, which is, right. right, it was back the depositors, call whatever you want. People fight amongst yourselves on Twitter. But, yes, they could have done it Friday night and it's, and spared us from Bill Ackman and David Sachs and everybody yes, making that up. Yes, that would have been nice, but they got, been nice, they got but the not, answer right. They got they the, got answer, the right. answer right, and they double got it right by saying, fuck the equity. Yep. So it was a hundred times. It was a government chat GPT improvement over 2008 where I spent, I spent years angry. I did too. Yeah. I did too. So, you know, I, I, but this is coming down the pike. I mean, these truthy stories are we – human consumers of the stuff, we are hardwired to respond to it. So it's never been more important for us to air gap ourselves from it. It's never been more important for us to find other human beings who don't think of us as a means to an end, as a as a cog in whatever machine they're trying to, to do. And I'm trying to get, really get back to being ruthless about pursuing the spread of creativity, new ideas, and discovery, because I think we've got a real shot with these new toolkits to do some amazing stuff. I mean, I can't imagine what it's like for you, Howard. I mean, I mean because this is the, the opportunity for, you know, a five-person shop to say, oh, yeah, I can, <laughs> why, why does this SEO industry even exist? I've got a five-person shop that can replace that now. I, no, I mean, I mean, listen, listen, if I... Uh... I look at stock tips and we've hung on, you know, all these companies that said they're going to be 100-year companies. I wanted to build a one-year company. We're at year 15. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Howie Town is uh, breaking all kinds of barriers. And now that I have a 15-year-old company, I'm more engaged with Rishi than ever saying, hey, man, we're like, I don't know. Like, we're lucky. Mm-hmm. And now with ChatGPT, we don't need anybody else. And now our data set is something that the machines don't have. Exactly. So it's like all of a sudden it's come full circle. We may not have the biggest and most interesting data set, but it's unique. It is, yes. Yeah, and that 
Message to buyers of stock twits, like we've raised our prices. <laughs> Sorry. Shout out to Howie Town for not selling. Yeah, the, uh, but it really has made me excited. But it also, the more the machines come into the world, I'm more physical, meaning like I'm getting in the golf business and I'm fascinated by pickleball, even, even though I'm not like investing in it. I'm fascinated that out of death, out of sports like golf, it came the live tour, top golf, and out of tennis came pickleball which is a thousand X tennis, right? Tennis was dying for yep. how many years? And now pickleball is three years in a row, fastest growing sport. We have this way while we're looking one direction that magic happens because That's of it. creativity, right? That's pickleball it. is just creative. If you don't like the four lines, go play par three golf or top golf or hit into a machine. Like we are at the cusp of glory for people that are creative. Like as Paul Graham, who, has, who wears sandals and white socks, tweeted today that the four biggest companies, Ethan sent me this intern, chief of staff sent me this today, that Paul Graham yeah, right. uh, is a 19-year-old chief of staff, Ben. That's AI. The, uh, yep. the four biggest companies in France, which is, I think, in the United States, right? Uh, I'm just trying to please the uh, center of the country with that statement. Oh, the uh, Shout out to, to uh, Mississippi. The uh, four biggest companies in France are fucking fashion companies. Yep. Which means that they're about to become tech companies. And all this NFT stuff that shouldn't be called NFT or whatever is all going to be applied to their products. Whether it's Swiss watches or, you know, Swiss now shoes, $10 billion shoe company or Ferrari. We've written off Europe because they're not into tech and Italy just banned AI. Probably stupid, but banned it because they're Italy. Mm -hmm. God bless them. They have some of the best companies in the world with LVMH. And they're not tech companies, but they're about to become tech companies they, because they of AI. They for 100%. 100%. Because yeah. of the blockchain and AI. And we're fucking here fighting like idiots, making fun of Europe. So, Howard, it's time to get to work, right? It, 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 we, we've, all of us, and me included, have immersed ourselves in fiat world and this essentially, you know, masturbation practice of looking at our smartphones and responding to the latest, you know, Bon Mo or whatever on Twitter for rage engagement or let me think of something really clever to say. Mm -hmm. And I just don't have time for it anymore. Because well, we do. We're just not going to. We're going to hold ourselves a little more. We, you have to. You have to consider them as farts. Like people go, "How are you doing?" I go, "I just farted digitally farted. downwind." When you have more followers than everybody else, that's called farting downwind, and let other people clean it up. So yes, I don't, uh, I'm, with, I'm with you on that. So, so, so yeah, you, you are can, a great farter. You need to now leave the room and not engage with your and own not farts. wallow with it. Yeah, and I. So yeah. I'm. I'm just. It's it's time I'm to here get to, to help. work. It's time to get to work, man. Because the yeah, everything's everything comes back to golf, farts, and fashion, and uh, <laughs> that may be the new name of my show. Come and talk golf, farts, it and sings. fashion. It absolutely sings, Howard. It really does. Is your family good? My family's great. Thanks for asking. Awesome. And is Epsilon Theory crushing? I mean, the content's amazing, and you're a lean team like uh, Howard Lins and Enterprises over here. Exactly. Leverage, we're we're correct? we're a lean team, and yeah, I'll say it again. I mean, we started putting some of the stuff into our own internal work processes and it it changes everything because we're we're at this we're already at that intersection of words and narrative and markets and man this is this is a tool that just revolutionizes what we do two questions uh, yeah. first one is what was your aha moment with the 100x because you know ai they've talked about it forever and I guess I've been lucky being a venture capitalist or whatever we call myself, a Zerpy, um, when money was easy. And luckily, I got some money off the table. Now that I have, now that the world's gotten hard and everybody's attacking from all sides and Balaji's everywhere and Howie Town, uh -huh. it may not be as safe as it was. I have to step out in 5% interest rate worlds. What is it about ChatGPT that, that got you excited that maybe should excite everybody else? It was when I stopped trying to play gotcha with it and meaning ask it a question and then kind of that chuckle off. Oh, ha, ha, ha. you answered It'll that as a, you know, as a simpleton consultant would have answered that question. And then I started looking at, well, you know, turn it around. Stop being, this is a superhuman 
and yet very human assistant is the way to think about it. And it can get you 80 to 90% of the way there with being your librarian. You and I, Howard, are both old enough, you would go into an actual physical library and you'd go search for a book, you'd find it on the stacks, but the most important discoveries I ever had in learning were not the finding that book that I was searching for, but then I was looking at the other books that were next to it on that row and the other books that were above it and below it. That's where I had discovery that I really feel like these new transformers are able to enable not just search, but discovery. Yeah. For, for, for a creator, right, whether you're a business creator, whether you're an art creator, or the, what, content creator, what, whatever you are, if you're a creator, if you make something, this tool absolutely changes your life. Wow. That's what I got excited about. It. Yeah, I'm so glad I'm almost dead. <laughs> So, uh, it's, and then one last question. Yes. Because this will also affect crypto. Uh, you and I are both probably think the same way about it. Like, so I think everything is a Jew Holocaust. Like, man, those poor people, like, if they at least had Bitcoin, right? I mean, how else are you supposed to think about it? It makes no sense to me otherwise. Like, oh, have the candelabra before we go to the concentration camp? No, it's like, all right remember this password and we'll be rich if we survive or you know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. Okay. So that's all it means to me. And that's why I dabbled, but it doesn't mean much more to me after all these years and all this money. So where do we stand now with that? So the, the promise to me of say Bitcoin, blockchain, crypto, broadly speaking, the promise was in its ability to decentralize and the power that returns to us here in the middle if we have decentralization that gets away from the centralization of the state and big corporations. Right? That's where Balaji 1.0 stood. That's right. This is where he started. That's what trapped me into Balaji exactly. the first time. Exactly. That's why it's he's been a guest once. Exactly right. And now... What excites me so much about these generative AI and LLMs is that they're for real decentralized. They're out, mm. right? They're, they're, this so is they're a, the real centralization. They so are Bitcoin the, was they like the, QVC before the internet. Exactly. And, exactly, oh. because it got stuck in the world of money and number go up and all that crap. Where, oh, it's going to be, you know, replace the dollar is our reserve currency. And, and it, it, it becomes like, huh, it's a tough way to live your life, Howard, because I, I've known a lot of gold aficionados, I'm not going to call them gold bugs, that you end up the same way where you start rooting for calamity because that's what's going to prove you right. And that's just a miserable way to go through life. But say it's just my last 10 years, would you okay it? As a friend, <laughs> <laughs> the so oh, okay. I agree with you. What a great take, gentlemen! Great take. We're going to let him go. Uh, he'll probably be our first seventh time guest if he keeps cool, and uh, he's welcome <laughs> back in Howie Town anytime. I'd like to see the optimism because you know this is why I love you because I think there's just something out there. You know, like when I. Got lucky the first time making money was off of QVC. I didn't even know mm -hmm. what the fuck QVC was. Selling a squeeze ball to old people right before the internet, for Christ's sake. I thought QVC, QVC was going to be the world. QVC was the world. There was fucking Philadelphia was the center of the world because that's where QVC was. An instant before the fucking internet. And now, while I don't think Bitcoin goes away because of fucking humans mm -hmm. and the fact that Armageddon is a, a symmetric thing to hold some Bitcoin or whatever you want to hold in digital assets is does make sense to me at some level. I don't know what it would do for me because I don't know where I'm going. Um, the while you were looking over there, uh, the machines saved us, but could kill us. And yeah, both are going to go go forward. But right now, Howard, it's time to get to work and it's time to be an optimist again. It really is. Um, so good to see you on this side. Yeah, and right. I like yeah. The, I'm going to I like the rational optimist. I, I was an optimist and I think you have to be way more rational right now. And 
and really get down to curating. Oh, man. I mean, I miss some of my mentors. They've just disappeared from the Internet, as they should. They made money, and they got to take care of their families, and, and they want to uh, go out not miserable. Um, and they've moved on uh, to other cooler things. But this uh, this tool... I think I got digging alums another time, but this tool is fascinating. So I'm glad it's I'm glad it's got you over the hump. It there, did, and uh, it's great to catch up, buddy. Keep the faith, my friend. I shall, and <laughs> uh, we'll let you go. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Albert. Thank God we've had him on six times. I know it makes up for all the times I'm wrong. You know, when you're right, you need to stay right which I have with Ben six times and, and probably Josh Shaughnessy five times and Jeff Richards four times. And when I'm wrong, which is some of the people he mentioned in the show, it, we're all wrong. You just can't stay wrong. Right. And even at, listen, if you yell opinions out like Kramer did, you're going to be right 40, 50 percent of the time. So it makes sense that the people, if that works for them, they become the, the they become the, uh, what do you call it? The distributor of opinions. Um, but, you know, there's enough tools out there to, to just, be the product and start fucking being creative. So I love that. It's good because he's generally, you know, tense about things. Right. And he's but, you know, now flipped at saying like he's found his tool that will allow him to scale his right. community. You know what I mean? Social media was my tool to scale social leverage. And now there's this new tool that I'm, you know, Ethan, you better get on this because I'm, I'm old. on it. Okay. So there's this new tool. Knut, you and I are like fucking chat GPT. Sounds, sounds dirty. <laughs> the uh, there's this new tool to help us scale to the next level and build and stay kind of within uh, our group. But anyways, that was great to have Ben back. Always. You are listening to Panic with Friends, Knut, myself, and my chief of staff. Uh, we're not even going to name his name because I like the title. We're just going to rotate people into it. Uh, get together and talk to a guest, generally a venture capitalist, entrepreneur, Zerpy, the clown, someone who keeps us just a little bit ahead of everybody else. You don't have to be years ahead. You just have to be weeks and days ahead sometimes. And so you can find us on Spotify, Google, Apple Podcasts. Search my name, Howard Lindzen, or Panic with Friends. Subscribe, please, so we don't have to bug you. And then every Thursday, you will get a podcast. See you next week. Howard Lindzen is the founder and general partner at Social Leverage. All opinions expressed by Howard and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Social Leverage or StockTwits. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for decisions. Guests may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast.